We are here at the Wharton Global Economic Forum, and I'm joined here by the CEO of Related Companies, one of the largest real estate firms in the world, I would say. Jeff Blau, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We had a great conference out there talking today about sustainability, resilience, development amid technology, but you are the force behind Hudson Yards, which is one of the biggest developments. Uh, it is the biggest development in America right it's now, is it the largest development ever done in the United ever States. Ever done in the United there States, you there you go. Um, in planning Hudson Yards and thinking about the new types of tenants you are going to bring in, both residential, corporations, retail, entertainment, what was the mindset for bringing all these people west and selling them on the edge of the Hudson River? Right. Well, what we really had to do is really create something that had all those things that you just said. So it wasn't just office buildings, it wasn't just retail, it wasn't just residential, but have it all happen at the same time. So we really created that ultimate live, work, play neighborhood that people talk about and the way people want to live today and the way they want to work. And so when we started to attract companies, it wasn't just about fancy skyscrapers and great views, but it was about using real estate as a talent attraction and retention tool. And where do their future employees want to live and how do they want to live? We talked about one of our tenants, uh, VaynerMedia. So VaynerMedia is this incredibly successful social media uh, firm. And they have about 500 people in 50,000 feet, very dense. I'd say the average age is about 30 or on, under. No one's in a suit. Uh, they're in jeans and a shirt. And, and you go in their office at 9 in the morning, there's nobody there. You go in there at 9 o'clock at night, and it's packed. And nobody has landlines. They have cell phones. Nobody has desktops. They have laptops. And my guess when we open all of Hudson Yards, when the plazas open and the retail, they're not actually in their office. They're down in the plaza on their laptops. They're in the restaurants. They're in the coffee shops checking into their office. And I think that's really the future of work and how the workspace has evolved and why it is much more dense than it's ever been before. But, and they also live in and around the neighborhood because people are tired of commuting. And so West Chelsea has become the fastest growing residential neighborhood in New York. And you're connected to and Lower we're connected Manhattan to it. Through, so. the, through the whole West Side. Right, well, and, the, and transportation was a huge part of everything. So when, when we started, the city committed two and a half billion dollars to extend the never, number seven subway. So we're now three stops, six minutes from Grand Central, and we connect from every other subway line in the city. So you can basically get here from anywhere. Now, how did you sell this to corporations who said, you know what, we have big corporate centers in big buildings, we, have, we look to Midtown Manhattan, we look to the East Side, or other cities, but how did you sell them on this? It, it was a combination of New York City having really old buildings and not keeping pace with other cities around the world, and so we were providing state-of-the-art, great technology in the buildings, great efficiency of the spaces, great views, but also it was what I said about using real estate as this talent attraction tool so that CEOs could hire people, not just by paying more, but promising this great work environment of restaurants and retail and residential living. And, and that's really what, what convinced the CEOs to make this happen. And how important is green space in the design of any development that you're looking at today here in New York or anywhere else in the country? It's incredibly important, not just green space, but just public open space. We have this incredible square right in the middle with uh, a piece of uh, sculpture or art, it's hard to be uh, clear what we're gonna call it yet, designed by Thomas Heatherwick that's 150 feet high, 15 stories in the center of our plaza, designed by Thomas Heatherwick, that's a series of stairs that the public's gonna be able to walk up and down and access it. I mean, it's, I think every single person that comes to New York is gonna come see this sculpture, and that's gonna open in, in March. All of Hudson Yard is gonna open March 14th of next year. But doesn't green space cost you money? I mean, this is space that's not being used. It's not being leased to a tenant. But you wouldn't be able to lease any space if you didn't have it, and it's, it's, good, city, it's good planning for cities, it's in fact, the cities are, are requiring it. So they'd rather have you densify certain areas of the site and maybe have taller buildings like we have and have more open space. And I think ultimately that's gonna be how zoning evolves in cities. So, and obviously you couldn't have done this without new zoning, without the city behind you. Give us an idea of what it took in the planning of this with the public-private <coughs> partnership that the city had to allow this for So you. the Bloomberg administration was you know, incredible in thinking about zoning and thinking about the future of New York City. And so they, first they invested $4 billion before we started in and around Hudson Yards. So two and a half billion for the subway, but they also created more green space. They created more parks around. They expanded the Javits Convention Center. So there was so much that happened before we even showed up to make it a place that people wanted to go. So critical infrastructure is, is very, very important. 
And when we look at cities of the future, we talk about you know autonomous vehicles. We talk about changing the way we travel, changing the way we work, changing pretty much everything, which changes urban planning. Right. What do you see as a city of the future? So, and the autonomous vehicle story, I think, could have the biggest impact on cities more than anything we've seen in our lifetimes. If you just think about um, how people are going to get from here to there, and all the traffic that we have outside, and you know it takes an hour to cross town now. If you start thinking about Mobil shared mobility, right? autonomous vehicles shared, the number of cars on the road could go down by two thirds and we'd be serving more people. In fact, do we really need to spend all the dollars that go into our subway systems if, tra if traffic went away and shared autonomous vehicles were able to take people quickly from here to there at low cost? And you, know, you start thinking about planning and roadways and parking lots. And no lots more garages. And no more garages and the impact on city, it's pretty dramatic and I think I don't think it's that far away. I think that's in the next 15 years. And in your view, retail is not dead. Retail is not dead. I think retail is changing. And uh, retailers that don't adapt are going to die, and others are coming in right behind them. We have an entire floor at our retail complex at Hudson Yards dedicated to direct-to-consumer retailers that had started out online and now need a physical presence. Think of the Warby Parkers of the world. Um, that historically you would say is an online retailer, but now they have lots and lots of physical stores. And many of these online retailers are realizing that's where they have to go. And so I think those retailers that don't innovate are not going to be with us any longer, and those that do will survive. Okay, you heard it here. Retail is not dead. Jeff Blau from Related Thank Companies. Thanks so much. Thank you.